Uh, this paper is joined with Sebastian Ebert, who is now at University of Heidelberg, and Joran Koter, uh, who is at the uh, Rotterdam School of Management. Uh, at some point, we were all in Tilburg, where we were working on this paper. Um, and in this paper, uh, we're going to, the starting point of the paper is uh, the concept of probability weighting, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, this comes from psychology, from decision science. And uh, the notion is that, that human beings tend to overweight the probability of rare high impact events. Uh, and this has been shown in lots of experimental work. Uh, and since then, this has been incorporated in decision science uh, and also in economics and finance. Uh, and two of the seminal theories uh, that incorporate this probability weighting uh, are rank dependent utility and cumulative prospect theory. Uh, now, there are several applications of, of probability weighting in finance, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, relate to the literature later a bit more. Uh, but what we do in the paper is we're going to actually uh, do something that is, in a sense, very simple. We just take essentially uh, the most standard asset pricing model that you can think of, the classical CAPM, uh, and we're just going to add probability weighting to it. Uh, and we'll do that in, uh, in a sense, in a very simple way. Uh, uh, it will only involve one additional parameter, as you will see. Uh, the model will allow for tail overweighting. But the interesting thing is that, that this model, which we call the pi cap m, uh, uh, this model uh, will generate a lot of predictions uh, on the pricing of, uh, of assets and also on options uh, written on assets. Um, so uh, the pi, let me explain the pi. The pi is typically the symbol that is used in decision science for these uh, decision weights or probability weights. Uh, Right, so in a nutshell, uh, the idea of the paper is to develop, uh, first of all, a theoretical model, uh, a CAPM uh, with this probability weighting, and to generate a whole range of new predictions uh, on the pricing of, of volatility, skewness, and options. Uh, and what we'll also do in the paper, and I'll come back to that uh, later, is we're going to validate, especially some of the option implications, we're going to validate those empirically. So as I said, so the, the input of the model is, is, is very simple. So we start with mean variance preferences, uh, and we're going to add this probability weighting. So we call these pi MV preferences. Uh, so that, that's the preference side, right? So as I said, one, one parameter that we add to the mean variance model. Uh, the financial market, we also keep very simple. So in the presentation today, I will focus on the case where we just have two assets. And the assets are binary, so they have two potential outcomes. Uh, we also assume they have positive supply. Uh, the asset might be skewed, and that will be important. important and there's no short selling. In the paper, we extend this setting uh, uh, in different dimensions. So we are we can, the model does allow for many assets. The model does allow for many potential payoffs, so more than two. So not just a binary asset, but more payoffs. Um, but to keep it simple today, I will focus on uh, the two asset, two state case. Uh, and all the interesting effects can be seen in, in that setup. So what is nice is uh, with these inputs, we actually can analytically solve fully for the equilibrium and all the pricing expressions are analytical. Uh, so this means that we can directly compare all our asset prices and option prices to the, the CAPM prices. Um, and we can also do a lot of uh, comparative statics, uh, changing the skewness, volatility, correlations, and so on, and see how this affects asset prices. And we'll also have a range of propositions uh, about asset and option prices. So specifically, uh, we're going to generate five predictions that are largely new. Uh, uh, so the first one is that uh, we're going to see that idiosyncratic skewness of assets is priced. Uh, which it, of course, is not in the, in the CAPM, right? Isocratic risk is normally not priced. And we'll also see that the effect of skewness on the price can be positive or negative. Uh, uh, we're going to see the same for volatility. Again, isocratic volatility will not be priced in the CAPM. It will be priced in our model. And again, the effect of volatility can be positive or negative, depending on the skewness levels and on other parameters. So that's the second prediction. And, and these predictions, relate to a, a substantial empirical literature on how uh, volatility is priced, the seminal paper of Engedal in 2006, and also how skewness is priced, right? There's lots of papers on lottery stocks uh, showing that uh, high skewness stocks uh, might actually have uh, high uh, 
uh, uh, low returns and high prices. Um, so our paper relates to that, but also generates some new predictions that I will come back to. The third new prediction is that relative skewness is priced. So if you have two assets and one asset has negative skewness, then you really value if the other asset has positive skewness. So positive skewness is especially valued for an asset when other assets do not have positive skewness. Um, so, and we also, there's also some very empirical evidence uh, related to that uh, in the existing literature. The fourth prediction uh, is also a very interesting one. Uh, our model is going to generate what we call dependence exaggeration. So if we have two assets, uh, and even if these two assets, uh, the payoffs are not correlated at all, are independent actually, um, our investors will act as if uh, there is positive dependence between these assets. And that is due to the probability weighting, as I will explain. Um, so investors essentially price assets using higher correlations uh, than the true correlations. Uh, and there is a literature, an option literature, trying to establish the, the correlation premium from option prices. Uh, actually, some of my own work is also uh, on this. Um, and largely, this literature has indeed found that there is a positive correlation premium embedded in, in, in the index options and equity options. Uh, and our model essentially explains why such a correlation premium uh, could exist. And finally, uh, we're going to look at variance premiums embedded in options and, and skewness premiums embedded in options. And we'll also see that these variance premiums and skewness premiums are also depending on skewness of the assets. Um, and we're going to test those in the cross-section of options. So in a nutshell, what we're going to see is that, that assets with high positive skewness will have expensive out-of-the-money calls and very negative skewness stocks will have very expensive outer money puts, way more expensive than what you would expect on the basis of the cap M. And so expensive that the, right, the, the premiums on those uh, uh, strategies are, are substantial. So we relate to various literatures. Uh, there is a literature, as I said, on, on uh, asset pricing with probability weighting, the seminal work of Barbera Zouang, Poco uh, Vincenco Zhao, uh, Bala et al, uh, Barbera et al, 2021. Uh, essentially, what we add to that literature is uh, that we uh, we take the cap M, right? Uh, for example, Barbara is a one start with prospect theory uh, and essentially focus on one uh, skewed asset. Uh, we take the cap M, which is a different starting point. Uh, and the advantage of that is that uh, it's very tractable. So we have a, a very simple equilibrium uh, with uh, analytical expressions. Uh, and we can also look at multiple assets and uh, look at correlations and how these affect prices. Um, we relate, as I said, also to the, the literature on how volatility, skewness, correlation is priced in stocks and options. Um, so essentially, the contribution of our work is that we have underpin theoretical underpinnings of those results, and we also have some new predictions there. And finally, we relate to the, li the literature on variance premiums uh, and skewness premiums embedded in options. In particular, we're going to look at individual stock options, and we're going to see how uh, those options are priced and how that depends on skewness. Okay, so uh, this is the roadmap for the presentation. So I'm going to, of course, start with the model. Um, and then we'll go to the predictions, and I'll spend definitely some time on the empirical tests that we do on the option data uh, uh, in the cross section. Okay, as I said, in the presentation, I will focus on the two asset case. Just to, uh, so the setup is super simple. We have two assets, X and Y, uh, and they have uh, a binary payoff. Uh, the Y asset we're usually going to think of here as uh, like a stock market index, and the X asset is a, a small stock, uh, not an E index or some other asset. Um, so the Y asset, as you will see, has a probability of a half going up and the probability of a half going down. So that's symmetric. So we're mainly going to vary skewness of the X asset. So the probability of X uh, determines the skewness uh, of this X asset. And there's also a correlation between the two uh, assets. Now you may think that this is extremely simple and it is of course. On the other hand, the nice thing of using binomial distributions is that uh, if you give me any mean variance or skewness number, 
I can match it with a binomial distribution, right? So the three degrees of freedom, uh, the upper state, the downward state, and the probability, and you can match the, the first uh, three moments with that. Um, and that makes it very simple, and it's also very easy to do any comparative statics. So I can easily vary the mean or the variance and the skewness without uh, keeping other parameters constant. Uh, and as I said, in the paper, we have extensions for multiple states of the world and uh, more than two assets. Now, the setup is very standard. It's a one period model. Uh, the investor has wells at time zero, uh, can invest in the two assets, or there's a riskless asset. Uh, and we have a standard expression for terminal wells where uh, right, your, your return dep depends on what you pay for it today and what's the payoff at the end uh, of the period. So that's all fully standard. So you have a return on the, the risk-free asset and returns on uh, uh, X and Y assets. So that's just like the regular CAPM. Uh, and also the equilibrium concept is completely uh, uh, based on the regular CAPM. There's some supply of both assets. And then equilibrium, the market's clear. So the investors uh, hold the supply and the investors at the same time maximize the utility of terminal wells. And this is where the innovation comes, right? This pi MV utility, as I'll show you in a second. Um, the, the investors don't maximize the, the regular mean variance utility, but they maximize the pi and v utility. So what is this pi and v utility? Uh, in a sense, it's very simple. So we have a utility function of wells, and in the regular cap M, you just trade off mean and variance, right? Where the risk reversion parameter gamma. Uh, and our investor is going to do the same uh, with one important difference, instead of using the objective expectation, uh, the investor is actually distorting uh, the expectation with decision weights or probability weights. Um, and the, the, these decision weights or probability weights we call pi, small pi, ij. Um, and essentially, uh, the investor is thus trading off the distorted mean versus the distorted variance. Right? And these are expressions are given on the slide. Uh, so right, we have here a distorted mean uh, and a distorted variance. And these uh, pies, these decision weights, you can think of them as probabilities because as you will see, they will add up to one. Uh, but in the decision science literature, these are really seen as, as part of the preferences uh, because the experiments that they are based on is, are typically experiments where people know the probabilities. So this is really about preferences and not about beliefs. Uh, so the investor uh, essentially chooses or uh, right, has a preference structure that makes her uh, distort uh, use decision weights uh, when calculating expectations and variances. So how does these distortions look like? Um, well, we're, what we do here is we're going to uh, use this probability weighting function uh, let me actually first go to the next slide. So you might be familiar with the Prelec uh, probability weight function, or if you're familiar with prospect theory, you know there's also an S-shaped uh, probability weighting function in there. Uh, we're actually going to use the probability weighting function of uh, Chateauneuf et al., uh, which is a neo-additive probability weighting function. And it's, it's very simple, and that will buy us a lot of tractability. So how does that work? Well, uh, so let's start here. So suppose we we have two assets and two states of the world for each asset. So in the end, we have four states of the world, a state of the world where both assets pay off their high amount uh, and all the way down to the, the state of the world where both assets pay off their low amounts. Now, essentially the probability weighting uh, will have a function W and this W essentially is going to distort uh, the cumulative probabilities of each event. And if we directly look at the right, we see what happens. So essentially, this neo-additive probability weighting function introduces a parameter A. And this parameter A is going to overweight the very extreme events, both the positive and negative one, and it's going to underweight the middle states of the world. Right? So essentially, right, if we look here, uh, the best state of the world, uh, we add this plus A, so we give more weight to that event, and we downweight the middle two events. And again, we give more weight to the very bad state of the world. Um, 
So this is uh, th this is what essentially what it looks like. And graphically, right? This is uh, uh, then uh, this new additive probability weighting function, right? So on the x-axis we have the cumulative probability, and then we have this distortion w, the function w. Um, and the a parameter is that right the vertical shape uh, at zero and at one uh, both right so this is where we distort uh, the probabilities so the extreme events um, and this is it's a bit different from the s shape and the prelec probability distortion function that are smoother functions uh, but the, uh, this function captures exactly the same idea right so the idea of probability weighting is that extreme events, both positive and negative, are overweighted, and that uh, events that are uh, more common uh, in the middle, uh, less extreme, are underweighted. Uh, and this is a very simple way uh, to achieve uh, this behavior of, of investors. Um, Just do, do you mind I uh, interrupt yeah. you? <laughs> nice you? Hi, hi. hi. Uh, this is nice. So I'm thinking. So you start with the utility function already. It's a simple one, the mean variance utility function, right? So yes. you can say, okay, that utility function is now enough. You can think of it as a base utility and the distortion of probability is just a way of generating more flexible utilities to match whatever behavior. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking this actually has sort of an analogy to the usage of say black shoes model Originally, it is a model, but if you can think of it as a simple benchmark, then the model doesn't fit anything, but you can distort the implied yeah. vol. At yeah. least try to distort the implied vol, then the uh, out of money implied vol is higher. You are saying, I'm just adding more probabilities, distorting it higher to make yeah. the model work. So it's sort of in that sense. Uh, that's true. No? Uh, I agree. Yeah. And indeed, in this case, the distortion really. I think in the decision size, it would, it would say comes from preferences. So it's not about uh, right using a different distribution. But I think that's the same in your analogy that in black shows you would really distort the log normal, but you distort directly in black vols. Uh, if you, you start with normal with the distortion of another layer. Right? So yeah. the question is uh, maybe this is true how you are calibrating these distortions? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So what we do, you will see. Um, we do two things. So we'll have numerical examples where we use where th this parameter A will take from experimental evidence. Okay. Um, and we'll see that that actually generates very large effects, uh, maybe even too large, perhaps. Um, and then we'll have some predictions uh, on the various premiums that we test empirically, really. Um, what we haven't done there is to really sort of back out the A parameter that would fit sort of the variance premium results. Uh, but we okay. test sort of more the directions of the effects that we uh, predict. Uh, so far. Okay, I see. So you don't really back out A, but you are using some A to generate yeah. some effects. So we okay. use the numerical examples, we'll, we use the A from experimental, experimental evidence. And yeah, the, the, the empirical test is more directional, so far at least. But I mean, maybe implying out the A from the empirical results I think in, in principle it should be possible. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yes. can I jump in? And so like Alessa Soretta had a question for a while, so you may want to postpone it uh, a little bit. Uh, so Alessa is asking about the implications of your results and your model for the cross-section of skewness and the aggregate market skewness. So he, space, he says like, uh, KPM worked until late 60s, then it stopped working. At the same time, the cross-sectional skewness of return increased dramatically. Is that the way to think about this? So ah, um, so I think our model is really about preferences um, because we will see that there will be even price implications for especially also for options and for correlations uh, if there's no skewness in the true data at all. Um, so, uh, so our model is not about um, explaining sort of dynamics of skewness itself. It's more given any, give me a skewness level and I can tell you with these preferences what the price effects would be. Um, so, uh, so it's really about given skewness, uh, how prices are formed. And it's not so, our model is not so much about dynamics of skewness over time or the, how much skewness there is, variation there is in the cross section. Uh, and then there is another question. We have a raised hand. So, Stigamas, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
you know, uh, appreciate this, of course, is bringing behavioral elements in distorting the details. This is exactly what behavioral uh, finance is, you know. The, my, my, I have the following question. I have no problem with the equilibrium established uh, this way. Mm -hmm. I do have a problem about the option uh, market being affected by this kind of behavioral because we know that the behavioral finance is primarily for retail investors and the option market is overwhelmingly, at least in the index component of it, by institutional investors, which I don't think well, I don't think this behavioral finance applies to them that much. Yeah, no, uh, it's a fair question. Um, to our defense, we're not going to look at index options. So we we'll look at individual stock options, where especially I think the last decade, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the proportion of retail investors has increased uh, dramatically. Um, so in that sense. Uh, yeah, model uh, speaks more to that. Uh, whether to what extent the behavioral biases are also present at institutions, I think yeah, there is literature on that. Uh, also, mutual fund managers sometimes um, showing uh, signs of this, but but that's a different debate, I think. Uh, uh. A quick follow up. I think uh, that uh, question by Alessio could it be useful to you down the road, right? If you think of a way of calibrating the distortion to the skill, then you know you might be able to accommodate this behavior that can have changed. All right. Yeah. Based on his story, you can say, you know, until the 60s, there's no skill, then there's no distortion. Currently, there is a distortion. But well, distortion is part of the utility function. Maybe people's utility function has changed or the preference has changed. Yeah. But no, no. if you can do this calibration and show with this calibrated utility, you know, things still work. That would be pretty interesting. Yeah, agreed. Thanks. No, that's that in principle, that's possible. So um, if there's enough variation there, uh, you could uh, analyze indeed how the pricing of skewness has changed, when skewness has changed, uh, both in the time series and cross section. Yes. OK, thanks for those questions. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, so feel free to ask more. Uh, Okay, where was I? So this is uh, our probability weighting function. Um, and as I said, so the A parameter is all we need, essentially. So if A is positive, we have a probability weighting. If A is zero, we have no probability weighting. Now, what is going to be crucial when we're going to derive the equilibrium is this linearity over here. Uh, because the typical problem of the kahneman swarovski or the Prelec probability weighting, as we will see, is that when you think of uh, an investor, uh, the investor is going to use these decision weights to make decisions, but those decision weights depend on, uh, will depend on the portfolio that the investor chooses. Uh, and the portfolio that the investor chooses will affect the ordering of the wells in the different states, uh, right? Depending on what, how many stocks or what, uh, what, uh, how, how the investor is going to divide or money over different stocks. So that typically makes the optimization very hard because uh, you're optimizing, those decision weights are endogenous, endogenous and they will depend on the portfolio weights. Uh, and as soon as you change the portfolio weights, your decision weights might change, your ordering might change, and that leads to discontinuities even in the, the goal function. Um, now the nice thing of this, this neo-additive probability weighting is that in the middle states, the distortion is exactly the same. Uh, and that's because of this linearity, of course, in this function over here. So the distortion only happens in the tails, really in the tails. Um, so that makes that our uh, distortion, uh, our decision weights are not affected by the ordering of the, all those middle states. Uh, now we only have two, but you can, can have many more if you have more assets. And that makes that we can actually use standard techniques to solve for the equilibrium. Uh, in contrast, I mean, there's a paper by Ingelson in the Critical Finance Review, which sort of shows all the problems of, of probability weighting and finding uh, equilibria. Um, and, and with these assumptions, this is, of course, ad admittedly a very simple probability weighting function, but with this assumption, we can solve for it in a very simple way. So when we do that, we get um, uh, equilibrium prices. Uh, so let's focus on the X asset, right? That is the, the skewed asset. 
And of course, the price will depend on the, the distorted mean, on the distorted variance, and the distorted covariance, right? That's a standard. I mean, without distortions, this is standard cap M, right? The price of the asset is the expected payoff corrected for risk, right? Um, so that's all fully standard, except now we have these distortions. And the nice thing is that we can analytically calculate these distorted moments. And the, these expressions over here directly show us what's going to happen. So first of all, the distorted mean. So what's the, what we see, the distorted mean is equal to the actual mean times our probability weighting parameter times the skewness times volatility, right? So what we see essentially if skewness is positive, then the investor is going to overestimate, not overestimate, but going to use a higher mean for the asset than the true mean. Um, and that's because with a positively skewed asset, uh, well, that's an asset that has with low probability, a very high payoff. And the probability weighting is exactly so that low probability events are overweighted most in a relative sense, All right? So a positively skewed asset is going to, uh, the investor is going to attach a lot of weight to that small probability high payoff event and is going to attach relatively less weight on the bad state of the world. Um, so that means that we have this positive term here. If the skewness is negative, it's the opposite, right? So then, uh, the investor attaches lots of weight to the bad extreme negative event. So that's the first effect. The second effect is the variance. So our distorted variance is always higher than the actual variance. Um, and this is the expression. It depends on skewness and volatility. Um, and the intuition is again that with probability weighting, you put more weight on the extreme events. So that the big outcomes with low, which have low probability uh, and that is going to imply a higher variance than the true variance. And finally, we see that the covariance, the, the distorted covariance is again, as we, we have a proposition on that, is always higher than the true covariance. And specifically, even if, it, if suppose the true covariance is zero, then the, the distorted covariance that the investor uses for pricing is actually positive always. Um, and the intuition is again, if we go to our uh, decision weights, uh, if you think about covariance, right? This covariance between X and Y. Um, so the high state of the world is when X and Y both pay off uh, their high amounts. And the worst state of the world is when they pay off the low amount. These events are overweighted, right? So the investor puts more weight on these events where both assets pay off a lot or both assets pay off a lot. Very little. It's very intuitive, very simple, but it hasn't been this implication of probability weighting hasn't been shown before. Um, but that's important. So the implied covariance is higher than the actual covariance. Now, uh, in the rest of the talk, so what we're going to do, we're going to study the implications of the pi cap M. We'll have propositions and we'll have a calibration of the model to, to show numerically um, how large the effects are, where we use experimental evidence to calibrate the A parameter. Uh, so I have to keep a bit of an eye on the time. Um, so I'm going to skip this. Well, uh, we check the cap M can it allow for arbitrage under some parameters values. We make sure that's not the case in our paper. Um, so let me go to the predictions. Uh, so prediction. So the prediction. The first prediction we have is uh, the effect uh, uh, of skewness on the price. And the proposition. Well, it reads a bit. And difficult, but essentially what we show is that uh, there is uh, the effect of skewness on the price is positive uh, when skewness is negative uh, or, or low, and the effect of skewness on the price is uh, negative uh, when skewness is high. Uh, and the intuition essentially uh, can be seen from uh, these expressions over here. So, so essentially what happens when we increase the skewness? Well, first of all, the expected payoff using the distortion is going to go up, right? So the investor, uh, so the more skewness, uh, right? If you uh, increase it, the expected payoff goes up. So that will increase the price. However, over here, we see um, that the variance has a quadratic uh, dependence on uh, skewness. And that can be seen in this graph over here. So here we have the variance uh, of the skewed asset under the distortion. 
and the straight line here is the, the true variance and where you have skewness on the x-axis. So that's a quadratic dependence of the, the variance on skewness. So if we start, for example, at minus three, then if we increase skewness, then actually the variance that the investor uses for pricing goes down, right? So that's good, right? So that will also increase the price further, right? A lower variance. And the same happens for the covariance, which is shown over here. So the covariance, is uh, that you, is you, the distorted covariance essentially goes down until skewness is zero and then goes up again. So essentially what happens is that if, if skewness, right? So if you start at, at minus three, we're going to increase skewness. Well, the expected payoff is always going up. But that's good for the price or increasing the price. First variance and covariance are going down, but at some point they start to increase and they increase quadratically. So at some point, uh, the risk effects are going to overtake the mean effects. Right, so, so this is why we have this very subtle effect of skewness on the price uh, of the assets. Uh, so skewness, and uh, remember in the cap M, the effect is zero, right? If there's ice, only isocratic risk, uh, but here the effect uh, can be positive or negative depending on the parameter values. Um, and to quantify this, we have the graph here where we, we calculate the alpha. So these are cap M alphas at the annual level. Uh, so, for example, at a skewness level of minus one, uh, the x asset would have an alpha of 5%. So, that's quite large. Uh, so, it would, would have a positive alpha. So, this would have, and positively skewed assets. Uh, so, a skewed of, of three, for example, the alpha is about minus 5% almost. And this is in line with the lottery stock literature, right? So, if there's positive skewness, these assets have negative, uh, well, negative alphas, uh, low returns, and high prices. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time. Now we have similar results for volatility. So again, for volatility, uh, the effect of volatility can be positive or negative. Uh, and uh, essentially the intuition again comes from these moments that we had over here. So uh, again, we look at, let's look at the first moment because that's most important here. So if the skewness is positive, then more volatility is good. No, the investor likes that because where it is positively skewed asset, the investor is really attracted by this small probability, high payoff uh, state of the world. And if you increase volatility, that uh, high payoff will, will only be higher, right, in the model. Uh, and even it will be liked even more by the investor. So more volatility is good if skewness is positive. However, if skewness is negative, the opposite is the case, right? So if skewness is negative, of the asset, then adding more volatility is going to be disliked by the investor. And that's going to lower the price uh, of the asset. Uh, and again, this, this relates to the, the literature on how volatility is priced in the cross-section of stocks, uh, right? With some evidence indeed that why that high volatility stocks have negative uh, alphas. Um, we add a new prediction here that actually the effect of volatility should depend on the skewness level of the stock. So for, for positively skewed stocks, uh, the implications should be quite different than for negatively skewed stocks. And that's something that uh, uh, we would like to test in the future in empirical work. Okay, so um, now it's really time to get to, to option stuff. Um, so the correlation premium. So the correlation premium, our model also has implications for this. So the correlation premium in the, the option literature is the difference between the risk neutral correlation that you can calculate from option prices. Uh, so if you have equity index options and you have individual stock options, you can uh, back out an implied correlation. Um, that is a measure of the, the risk neutral correlation. And you can compare this to extra correlations. And this difference is what people call the correlation premium. Now, what we show uh, in our paper, well, first in terms of proposition, if A is zero, then correlation premium, uh, it's not clear whether it's positive or negative, depends on the parameters. It will typically be small. Uh, in our case, once we add probability weighting and for sufficiently small gamma, then it's always positive to correlation premium and it will be substantial. So in our calibration, uh, you will see, for example, if, if the true correlation is zero uh, between the two assets, the implied correlation is about 0.2. Uh, so that's a substantial difference. Um, and you also see that the correlation premium depends on the level of the correlation. And 
uh, if we look at the empirical work, uh, we do see that indeed uh, correlation premiums seem to be smaller for very high correlations. Okay, and then finally, let me turn to the, the implications for variance and skewness premiums. Um, so the, the variance premium, uh, I think everybody here will be familiar with, right? It's the difference between the risk-neutral variance and the, the actual, the expected variance or the, the true probability measure. Uh, and similarly, you can also define the skewness premium, right? As a difference between the, the third moment, uh, the, the risk-neutral third moment and the actual third moment. Um, so uh, we follow uh, Kozan, Neuberger, Schneider, uh, RFS paper uh, that actually uh, a very uh, useful expressions for the variance premium and in particular for the skewness premium for calculating this. Um, and essentially what they also show, as we all know, that the, the, the contract that sells variance, essentially, right, we know from Richard George Neuerberger, that is a contract where you sell out of the money calls and out of money puts, and that contract earns you, uh, gives you the variance premium. Uh, what Kozan, Neuerberger, and Schneider show is that you can also replicate the skewness contract in a very simple way. Uh, so selling skewness, you do by selling out of money calls with specific weights, of course, for different strikes and buying out of money puts uh, across the strike dimension. And if you do that in the correct way, then you can actually earn the skewness premium, uh, which you call SPX. Now we have propositions on uh, the skewness premium, the variance and skewness premiums, but let me just directly jump to the graphs because that's easier to, to, to see and that captures essentially what the proposition show. So let's first look at the left panel, which has the variance premium as a function of the skewness. Uh, so what we see, first of all, the straight, the solid line is the cap M. The cap M generates, uh, first of all, a tiny variance premium. That's not surprising. We know that if you do CR away with log normal, you get zero variance premium. So the cap M with binary payoffs, uh, you can see as an approximation of that. So that will, generate a very small variance premium. Um, and it's slightly negative for a positive skewness, slightly positive for negative skewness. That's all intuitive. That's because of risk aversion. Um, what we see is uh, when we look at the distortion, we get this uh, U-shape. So essentially what's happening uh, is suppose an asset has positive skewness. Uh, as we've seen before already, this investor really cares a lot about the low probability, high payoff event. So this investor is going to overprice, right, relative to the cap M, uh, out of the money call options a lot. Uh, the investor will underprice slightly out of money puts, but uh, to a lesser extent. So the net result is a positive various premium. For negative skewness, the opposite happens. The investor is going to care a lot about the bad state of the world, which has low probability, but a very negative return and is going to overprice out of the money puts relative to the cap M and underprice a bit uh, out of the money calls. Uh, so th this is why you get this U shape and around zero skewness, the variance premium is roughly zero. Um, now, if we look at the skewness premium on the right panel, uh, first of all, the cap M always predicts a negative skewness premium. Um, and our model uh, generates an increasing skewness premium as a function of skewness. And again, this has to do with this pricing of out of the money calls and out of the money puts, right? So for positive skewness, you, you attach a lot of value to out of the money calls. And remember that uh, selling skewness is selling out of the money calls and buying out of the money puts. Uh, so this leads to a very positive skewness premium. And if you have negative skewness, you get a very negative skewness premium. In this case, out of the money puts are very expensive uh, and you're buying those, right? So that generates a negative premium uh, and you're selling out of the money calls in that case. Okay, so this is what we're going to test empirically. So what we're going to do empirically, uh, we're going to look at the cross-section of stocks. So we'll have a cross-section of stocks with, which will give us variation in skewness. Um, and for each stock uh, for which we have options, we can calculate using the Kozan, Neuberger, Schneider methodology, we can calculate variance premiums and skewness premiums, and we can test the predictions. Uh, so this is what we do, right? So the, the predictions summarized again is that left skewed assets should have a positive variance premium, right skewed assets should, have, should also have a positive variance premium, and the middle should be zero. And for less skewed assets, the, the skewness premium should be negative, and the 
should be positive for rice cube acids. Um, and here, essentially, why this is about the shape, right? The VP should be U-shaped, and the SP should increase in the asymmetry uh, in absolute terms. So how do we empirically do that in detail? So as I said, we use Koza, Nurberg, Schneider to measure the variance premium and the skewness premium. The variance premium essentially, right, is the, the standard way to do this. You calculate the risk neutral variance embedded by options, and you look at uh, realized variance. Uh, and that's a, a realization, if you want, of the variance premium, which you have each month. So essentially, we have a panel of, of variance premium realizations or variance swap returns, if you want. Um, and the skewness premium is similar. So you can calculate the risk neutral skewness and you can compare this to actual skewness, realized skewness. Uh, so that's the return on the skewness swap. Uh, and again, we'll have a panel of skewness swap returns uh, for all stocks in the S&P 500 index. Um, well, we, uh, we proxy, we use the COSA methodology, we proxy skewness by implied skewness, um, right? Uh, because we know the skewness is hard to measure historically, or, or the past skewness is not always a good predictor of future skewness. So we use the implied skewness uh, to proxy the skewness level. So this gives us, as I said, a panel of skewness swap returns, variance swap returns for different stocks with different skewness levels. Um, and this, uh, allows us essentially to, to analyze, uh, uh, to test our predictions. Uh, so first of all, uh, before we do regressions, we just look at stocks with positive skewness. Uh, so skewness above 0.5. Then we see the average variance premium is about 0.036 in variance terms. Uh, so that's quite substantial. Uh, while for stocks that have negative skewness, it is 0.053. So it's also positive, even more so. Uh, and what is not uh, here, uh, that for stocks that are as skewed as close to zero, it's actually also close to zero, the variance premium. So that is in line with, with this U shaped behavior. Uh, as we'll do that in the regression in, in a second. And for the skewness premium, we indeed see that for positively skewed assets, the skewness premium is positive. It's a bit harder to interpret this economically. Uh, it's positive and significant. Uh, for negatively skewed as it, it is negative. Um, uh, so this is just essentially some data description. The next thing we do is to really test this in a regression. So we take on the left-hand side, we take uh, the variance premium or the skewness premium, right? That's our dependent variable. And we regress this on a constant in a Fama make best way. Uh, and then we have a, a dummy for whether skewness is positive or negative. And then we have the skewness itself uh, in absolute terms here uh, when it's negative. Um, and then we also, again, have the positive side, uh, uh, W4, when the skewness is larger than zero, right? So this is like a piecewise linear regression. So we want to see whether around zero, right, uh, there is this kink, because remember, again, the graphs, we should expect, right, a, a downward slope here and then an upward slope for positive skewness. And here we again should, here we should have an always upward slope, but uh, with slightly different slope. Now, what do we find uh, when we do this uh, found like best regression? Uh, for, let's first look at the variance premium. Uh, we beta one, so that captures uh, the stocks with negative skewness, has a positive variance premium of 0.038 uh, coefficient. Uh, so that's for skewness equal to uh, minus one. Um, and as a T set of 4.8, it's is very significant. Um, so that's positive, as you would expect, uh, right? Because we take the absolute value here. Um, and beta 2, we also expect to be positive. This is positively skewed stocks. They also have a variance premium, but it's a bit lower. And that's exactly in line with what we see over here, right? We have a downward slope here uh, and an upward slope here. Uh, and we indeed see that beta zero, which measures is the effect for stocks, the variance premium for stocks that have zero skewness, beta zero is slightly negative, but insignificantly so, right? So essentially what we see here is that the variance premium on individual stock options or embedded in, in the stock options varies in the cross-section with, with skewness and substantially so, right? So it's zero around uh, zero skewness levels and it's positive or very positively or negatively. Skewed stocks. 
So that's the variance premium. And then for the skewness premium, again, the predictions are in line uh, with the, uh, the uh, with the model. Uh, so we should get a negative coefficient here because why we take the absolute value, it's a bit confusing, but um, so essentially we find a positive slope here because we take the absolute value of the slope the coefficient is negative. And we should find a positive slope over here as well uh, for positive skewness. Um, the only thing we don't find this slope in the, in the model is a bit steeper. While in the, in the estimates, the slopes, yeah, this slope is point, uh, minus 0.166, this is uh, 0.169, they're quite similar. So the skewness premium seems to be roughly symmetric around skewness. Um, and again, around skewness zero, the skewness premium is roughly equal to zero, um, right? And insignificantly different from zero. And that's again in line with the predictions of the model, right? Around skewness zero, uh, the skewness premium is predicted to be zero. Okay, um, so I'm looking at the time. Uh, I think quite okay. So, uh, so to summarize, this paper essentially is a, a, a proposes a very simple way, in a sense, to to look at probability weighting and asset prices, taking the the, the standard asset price model, uh, the CAPM, and adding this probability weighting to it. Um, and we have predictions, as I said, on, on various dimensions. So, how skewed is a volatility of price across assets? Um, we see that the effect of skewness can be positive or negative, um, depending on the skewness level. The same for volatility. Uh, so we have new predictions on how skewness and volatility should be priced in the cross-section according to this model. And what I personally find quite interesting is the, the dependence exaggeration. That, that if you have probability weighting investors um, use covariances or correlations that are higher than the actual uh, covariances or correlations. And finally, we have implications for, for variance and options, uh, variance premiums, skewness premiums, and we test whether, right, in a directional sense, um, these uh, predictions are, are, very, uh, are validated, uh, and we find evidence for this. Now, there's more we can do. We can do more on the empirical testing, especially on the cross-section of stocks. There are these new predictions that we could test. Um, I got an interesting suggestion from Duren. Uh, on implying out the A parameter, so the, so the implied uh, distortion that we, we get from option prices, I think that will be interesting. Um, uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, so thanks for the question so far, and I'm very happy to, uh, to discuss further. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Just. Thank you. Perfect timing, excellent presentation, provocative results. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I would uh, encourage everyone to, who want to ask a question to, uh, unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask it uh i personally think like the if you can have some implications for the cross-section of stock returns that would be that would be cool right yeah no it's i mean we have this especially this volatility right so essentially so the Amital paper and there's a whole literature after that right uh showing that high volatility stocks have, have low returns um, so one prediction that we have is that this should only hold for, for positively skewed stocks. So for stocks with negative skewness, actually, we should find the opposite. Uh, I have no idea why that's the case, but that's a new test uh, of this. Uh, that's a prediction of this model. Um, so how volatility is priced uh, depends really on, on skewness. Um, and, the, and then, yeah, and it's intuitive, right? If you think about probability distortion, you only like volatility indeed for these lottery stocks. Um, you will not like it for stocks which have lots of crash risk <laughs> uh, intuitively, uh, or corporate bonds perhaps, right, with, with the probability of default. So, so I think that is one interesting prediction uh, that, um, that one could test on the cross-section of stocks or the cross-section of, of bonds, uh, potentially. Well, other people are thinking about questions. We have one qu extra question in the chat, so maybe you can. It's a long question, so maybe you oh, can look. Yeah, I'll try to read it. Uh... Is it fair to compare the known puzzle? I'll just read it out. Is it fair to compare the known puzzles, such as very correlation premium that's been estimated using a non-distorted set of probabilities to your results that the investor has distorted probabilities? Um, no, but essentially, uh, so maybe I didn't explain that uh, uh, clearly. Uh, so essentially, so our model generates risk-neutral uh, 
uh, a risk neutral distribution. Um, and using that risk, risk neutral distribution, we can calculate option prices and the, the variance and correlation premium. And that's exactly that mimics essentially what you do empirically. So empirically, you will imply out the risk neutral variance and the risk neutral correlation from options. And you will compare that to the, the actual uh, underlying behavior. Um, so that's, a, that's also what we do when we calculate our variance and correlation premiums. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in that sense, we, we replicate theoretically what you do empirically uh, in these analysis. Uh, we have um, one raised hand, so it's still on side. Uh, go ahead. That's uh, me, right? Okay, you do you un unmute me? Okay, just uh, okay. I maintain my reservations about the option market, but I admit I am intrigued by this generalization of the CAPM. Just one question since we did, uh, we did agree that you know, small uh, stocks, if you like, and individuals, etc. One implication would be that these, uh, if you like, behavioral phenomena would be more uh, predominant in small firms, okay? not in the big, if you like, uh, firms which attract a lot of institutional investors. So this would be, as a suggestion, a way of testing by separating them by say by size of assets in terms of, if you like, uh, the implications in the CAPM. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, well, happy to hear at least uh, <laughs> uh, you found it interesting and uh, to think about this. Uh, um, yes, I agree. And you, for example, you could also look at uh, if you take as a starting point that institutions have less biases than, than retail investors, you could also look at institutional ownership of stocks. Um, and I think there is evidence indeed that many anomalies are more concentrated in smaller stocks that are held more by retail investors. Yeah. Um, so indeed the prediction Again, if you take the standing, starting point that um, uh, retail investors have, have a larger A parameter than institutions, uh, then th those effects should be indeed be stronger for those types of stocks. Uh, that's that's fully correct. Yeah, so that will be an interesting way to um, to to look at this uh, from an empirical perspective. I'm always thinking the the opposite. That is. Um... You test this cross-sectional variations on individual name, but your distortion can be probably calibrated to the index. It's like, oh, I assume common market pricing, right? So the, from the index, you sort of learn what the institution or the average market is paying attention to the scale or the market correct or whatever. So we adjust the utility function because your numerics is a normal utility function. We adjust it based on the whole market institution. So you're not really doing what do we call it? The behavior finance in that case. You're still doing oh, rational matching the market. Given that you match the market with a more realistic market implied risk preference, then you generate cross-sectional price implications, whether it's solving the puzzle or making the puzzle even stronger, either way is fine. Right? Yeah. So actually I think it's a very interesting, I don't fully understand your, your setting, but it can be very, very interesting because you can, you are starting with a simple utility function, can think of it, and calibrate that like a, with a bias correction using some asset price, right? Some market asset price. Given that, you can generate many implications. No, uh, no, thank you. No, that's true. I think um, what the, the previous. Uh, no, it depends a bit on how you look at it. So one way to look at it is at least from one sort of more representative investor, and then you could indeed, as you say, calibrate it to the market. Yeah, if you think there's some different sets of investors, some behavioral, uh, some more rational arbitrageurs, then it's, I mean, that we don't have that in the model currently. Um, and then you need some limits to arbitrage perhaps so to get sort of this variation in the cross section. Um, but in an integrated market, indeed, uh, you could essentially calibrate everything at the index level. And then uh, the predictions for the cross section would follow uh, from there. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll uh, just interrupt here to uh, thank you and thank you all for having been here. Uh, this was a very interesting presentation. Thanks for the questions. Uh, you can stick around if you want to.